Bovine tuberculosis, also known as bovine TB, is a disease that farmers fear. If contracted, entire herds of cattle can be destroyed. Now, it may surprise you to know that animals in a safari park are just as much at risk as farm animals. Today, we'll follow the keepers and local farmers as they take every precaution to protect their animals against a disease that doesn't discriminate between the ordinary and the extraordinary. We're back today bringing you all the latest stories from the park. Jean must perform a pedicure on the pygmy goats. Why do I have the feeling this is going to be harder than it sounds? But she's got to catch them first. There you go. Oh, who's that? Keepers must work through the night to handle a high-risk arrival. This is a potentially very dangerous animal. Steady, steady. And staff are on tenterhooks whilst caring for the calf of a critically endangered species. You just can't guarantee anything. Literally, on a sixpence, they can be fine one day, the next, something's gone wrong. Parks such as Longleat are a sanctuary for animals under threat from extinction in the wild. But sometimes, even here, they're not safe. I remember back in 2001 when the park narrowly escaped an outbreak of foot and mouth, a disease that threatened the life of not just animals here in the park, but also surrounding farms. Now there's a new threat, bovine TB, another disease that doesn't distinguish between farm, small holding and safari park. And without vigilant testing by the team here, all the animals, even those that are critically endangered in the wild, are at risk. Bovine TB is a problem best known in cattle. But now, the disease may have made its way onto the park. Vets found positive results in a number of deer on the estate. But now keepers have no idea how far the disease might have spread. Many of the endangered species who live in sanctuary here are at risk, including the two new cheetah cubs. It's now a race against time to find the disease and stop it in its tracks. The longer it's on the park, the more species that could be affected. This series, we're following the biggest screening operation in the park's history. The man responsible is the park's head of animal operations, Darren Beasley. We have hundreds of animals here, so it's a huge undertaking. And then it's just the nail biting, the nervousness of waiting for those results. Today, team leader Amy has scrambled the entire team to begin testing 14 of the park's famous lions. It is a very big day today. We're doing lots of animals in the same house all at the same time. But unlike testing farm animals, testing a lion requires a full sedation. We're a safari park. Most of the things in here will either jump on you or eat you or chase you. Um, that's what we are. So when it comes to the big cats, these are dangerous animals. So we have to anaesthetise them, we have to sedate them. Once started, a lion will succumb fairly quickly to the sedative, but senior vet Chris Mangum and his team are following a strict protocol before anyone enters the lion's den. We just need to make sure that the, the sedatives work. You know, it's just such dangerous beasts, you can't take anything for granted. So we give at least 15 minutes, and then we make sure we poke them with a, a pole, and then what we'll do, we'll open the cage door and we'll go in and we'll poke them again with a stick and only when I'm really happy that they're fast asleep do we let anybody else in, which is just too risky um, not to take our time. Nothing on Klaus, boy. Okay. Anaesthetic drugs carry their own risks, so the animals are given as little sedative as possible. But it's vital to get the dose right. You don't want a lion waking up out of its pen. One hundred and eighty kilograms of muscle, topped off with razor-sharp teeth, these cats are killers. 
Once they're under, the clock is ticking. There's big risks any time we knock out any animal. They might not come back round, um, which is the biggest one, really. The other risk is actually they do come back round when we're actually in there or we've taken them out to, to do the work. So we try to do it as quick as possible, and that's why we've got so many people here all working together, all trying to do everything as quick as we can to get them back in. Screening is done by seeing how animals react to a controlled amount of TB bacteria. Now we're just TB testing them using the skin test, um, which basically involves measuring the skin on day one before we inject the samples. After three days, the same area is examined. If there's no swelling at the site, the animal is declared TB free. But if there is a swelling, then the animal has tested positive. It must then be put to sleep. This is day one, so in three days' time, we'll be doing the same process again. That's the big day, really, because that's when we actually find out whether we do have any animals that are positive for TB. All the keepers can do now is wait. We'll return later to find out the results for this killer disease, which determines the future of the entire park. Since she joined the team last year, Jean Johansson has been involved with her fair share of feed-ups. From the big cats of lion country to the giant anteaters of jungle kingdom, Benito and Moroni. Last series, we saw how they use their incredible tongues. She's headed back there today to test their other amazing adaptation, their claws. Hi, Charlie. Ah, I take it this box is for Benito? It certainly is. We've got him a nice pinata. Oh, perfect. And he's not in here yet, so tell me what's inside. Um, so in here we've got some leaves uh, mixed up with some mealworms and some crickets. Oh, good. All, All his, his favourite things. things. So what do you intend to do with it? What's the plan? Um, so we're just going to hang it up here mm -hmm. and then um, we will leave um, and he will come out and along with Moroni and hopefully come and rip it apart. Yeah, I remember meeting Moroni last year and she had massive claws so she certainly they'll did. be perfect for ripping this box to pieces. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So they use them to rip open big termite mounds in the, in the wild. Um, so hopefully we'll be seeing some of that behaviour with, with this box. Well, hopefully they're going to enjoy this. So should we get the box up there? Absolutely. Yeah. Now you have to help me out, Charlie, because I'm not going to know which one's Benito and which one's Moroni. How do I tell them apart? So the easiest way is Moroni is <laughs> a lot greyer than Benito. Ah, um, OK. And she's got much longer hair on the side. So are they using that sense of smell now? Do you think they can smell what's in the box? Yeah, definitely. You can see their noses waving around all over the place. Well, they're kind of just walking around and exploring at the moment. And actually, Moroni seems to have got to the box first. I thought she would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Oh, there she is, up on her hind there leg. She She's not sure about movement. <laughs> she can't yeah. get a balance. She's going to have to work for it a little bit. And Benito's up there as well. I really want to see them hooking in claws into those boxes. Yeah, there. you can see he's trying. But um, obviously, it's moving around quite a lot. Oh, oh and they've pulled She's... it down. And they go straight in there. <laughs> Heads right in there. Yeah, and I think they're using those claws to just pull that box apart. They're really getting stuck into those treats. So you, I can see their throats moving a little bit. Is yeah. that the tongue that's causing that? Absolutely, yeah. It's a huge muscle that obviously rolls up when mm. they're sucking the tongue in, in and out. So you can see it really working nicely there. Yeah, they're such an amazing looking animal, so unique. Well, it's lovely to see them both kind of enjoying that they're treat. Loving it. He's sharing quite nicely, actually. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> At this time of year, when the weather isn't great, the fields in the African safari need time to recover from the heavy rainfall. It's at this point that the heavy-footed rhinos come down to the lower paddock to allow the fields to recover. But the rhinos need access to mud. Without it, their skin can become dry and damaged. So today, I'm joining Tina to give them a mud bath, my favourite. It's going to get a bit messy. Is it going to get a bit yes, messy? Come on, let's, let's get straight in. So we've got some mud here. Yep. Where's, where's it? Where, where are we going to...? Uh, just in the crush behind us. So we've okay. warmed it up, so it's nice and warm because it is cold weather. Yep. And this is the rhino you want. OK, so, so who, who have we got here? This is Marashi. Marashi. Uh, she's one of our adult females. Yep. So if you want to pull the lever there... Pull, pull the lever. This, and then this one? Yep. 
and then we just pull this bit down here. Yeah, there we go. And that's a camera, she. And she's going to come in there. That's it. And once she's in, just shut it behind her. She's a big girl, isn't she? She is. That's it. Good girl, okay. the boon. Wait there. There Perfect. we go. I'm desperate to get my hands muddy. So you muddy. just got to get your hands in yeah. there. Nice big ball. Yep. And then... And where do we want it? All over? All over, yep. On the top, on the sides. As now, far as you can reach. Now, I've been out in Africa a number of times, and obviously they love to wallow out there. Yes. In Africa, this keeps ticks and things off the skin as well and helps keep parasites away. What good does this do in the heart of Wiltshire? Um, exactly the same. Um, in the summer, it keeps the parasite, you know, they're biting flies. But in the winter down here, you'll find that once you put the mud on, their skin does get a bit dry, so that what they'll do is go off and find a good scratching log, mm -hmm. and then all the dry skin be, can be scratched off. It encourages them to do that behaviour, and that way it exfoliates their skin. You know what, you think of rhinos as being these big, tough, almost armoured creatures, and yet we're giving them... A mud pack. They're actually quite soft, aren't they? They are. Their skin is quite thick, but they can feel an insect land on them. And in the summertime, they obviously do this themselves. They don't need your assistance because they're out in the fields. Exactly, yes. They'll make their own wallow, which can create a bit of a mess for the visitors as they have to drive around it, but they're fully capable of doing it themselves. Fantastic. Well, Tina, I have to say this is a pretty unique experience. Thank you very much for uh, letting me help you give a rhino a mud pack. Anytime. I know, you've been very good, very good. Caring for rare animals often calls for some good old-fashioned trial and error. One keeper who knows this more than most is team leader Mark Tai. Under his watchful eye are the park's group of pinkback pelicans, a species who simply refuse to breed in captivity. All across the country, collections have tried and failed to convince their birds to nest. But around 20 years ago, Mark decided to hand build nests for them. We built these pods for them because we figured that they were tree nesting birds, so we'd raise them up off the ground. And that one event was the spur that got everything kicked into gear. And, you know, they started nesting. And very soon after, we started getting eggs and we got the first ones incubated. And, and the first chick uh, came along and was hand reared. Since that first chick, they've had huge success, with 35 more hatched into the group in Pelican Cove. But they've all been hand-reared. Mark believes pelicans simply aren't natural parents in captivity. The parent rearing side has been rubbish, for want of a better word. They've fought over eggs and, you know, dropped them in the water, or the time of year has never been very good. So there's always seemingly been something in the way of getting them to actually do it themselves until now. And this time they've hatched one out and this time it's worked. For the first time in the park's history, a pelican chick is being successfully reared by its mum and dad. We're extremely excited about it. It's taken us 22 years to get to this point. So it's uh, quite something else. The chick is now 38 days old, and Mark is delighted with its progress. It's looking really good, um, starting to stand just slightly. They do tend to just shuffle around when they're young, but it's now starting to put some pressure up on its legs and um, has been feeding from the, from the father this morning. The parents will actually just regurgitate whatever they've got. The chick will pick it up and help itself. Um, as it gets bigger like it is now, it kind of forces the issue and we'll actually, you'll see it going up round the side of the parent's beak and almost make the parent open the beak and then it will be in <laughs> and the head will disappear down their neck and you'll see them pulling out bits of fish and everything, so it's quite dramatic to watch. Mark's hoping that successful parenting here will catch on. I'm just delighted because all the other birds now within the group are seeing this bird rearing next door they're learning from that, so hopefully as the future goes on, we won't have to hand rear hardly any, but the parents will hopefully all do it themselves. Of all the animals on the estate, some of the most important are the giraffe. These are Rothschild giraffe, one of the most endangered species with less than 700 left in the wild. 
Over the past 50 years, the park has made an extraordinary contribution to the world population, with 121 calves born here. Last year, when a heavily pregnant Ella started showing signs of being in labour, the keepers used a small video camera to bring us exclusive footage of the nerve-wracking event. Well done, a couple of really good pushes and it'll be out. OK, so that's another good push. Finally, the calf appeared, but had it survived the six-foot drop? We just need movement. As the moments ticked by, the calf showed no signs of life. OK, it's moving. Yeah, um, and it's breathing. The early signs were all positive that the calf was healthy. It's in a good position, it's not twisted. Its legs are in a good position. Well done, Darren. After 15 months of pregnancy, Mum Ella was delighted to meet her new baby daughter. This year, there's another new addition to the herd. We've got some big news. Last night, our female giraffe Gertie had a baby, so um, we've been expecting it a while. Uh, she went into early labour yesterday morning, um, and it was there this morning when we came, came up, so... At the minute, um, it's doing well. Our cameras have never been allowed inside the giraffe house on the day of the birth to see a newborn, until today. This is a first for, for Animal Park fans because um, we've never actually shown them on the day, just because we like to give them that bit of time. But this one's really strong, so um, come and have a quick look. If we just head in and just stand in the doorway, so if, um, if the girls want to go and stand at the back, they can get out of the way of us because being giraffes, they're quite nervous. Hello, puppets. Here they are, steady, steady, steady. Can you see its feet? It's hiding. There it is, less than six hours old. It has done all the right things. It's feeding, she's cleaning it, she's looking after it. A newborn in the giraffe house means Keeper Dan is on red alert. Despite their size, these calves are very fragile and a lot rests on the next few weeks. If there's one thing I've learned in my time being here, you just can't guarantee anything. Literally, on a sixpence, they can be fine one day, the next something's gone wrong. So it is just a day-by-day -day thing. But at the minute, everything is going the right way. For now, the big question is, boy or girl? I do think it's a boy, so if it's a girl, I'm going to look very silly, but um, he'll grow up to be as naughty as the rest of them, I'm sure. I'll be back later to find out how he or she is getting on. Earlier in the show, we saw how the park's flock of pink-backed pelicans successfully raised a chick themselves after 20 years of failed attempts. Well, Jean is about to meet this very important new resident. It's been eight weeks since we saw Mark with that precious chick, so I'm here to see how they're getting on. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jean. Now, I can see that lot over there are all quite big. Which one's the chick? It's the one at the back. Yes, I can, can see. You can see quite dark, which is pretty big. It ah. doesn't look like a chick anymore. How many weeks old exactly is Well, it's chick? just over 12 weeks now. 12 weeks yeah. now? So it's left the nest, decided to be on its own. So should we go over and take a closer look? Yeah, I'd love to. It's not surprising the chick has grown up fast. Oh, then, back up. These birds are voracious feeders, eating up to a kilo of fish each day. They're all sort of sticking together at the moment. Is this the way we'd see them out in the wild? Pretty much so, yeah. Mm. They will congregate in large groups. And how's our new chick fitting into the gang, then? Really well. As you can see, the chick is um, 
in with the rest, fighting its corner, going for the food, uh, which is all Ooh. great because it shows now that it's become completely independent. It's mm -hmm. left its parents. Great, so that's a good thing for you to see. Yep. Absolutely, it's great. it's great. I mean, you know, having had so many failures, because we have given these birds plenty of opportunity to rear their own, mm -hmm. and it's just never happened. You know, the chicks die normally around about a week old, and this one um, has been an absolute blooming miracle. We've sort of shown now that we don't need to worry about them as much as we thought we did. Mm -hmm. You know, for them to be able to rear them out in cold and frost and all, all that kind of horrible winter conditions just goes to prove that, you know, they don't need us as much as we think. So will you attempt to do it again? Definitely. They've proved they can do it once, so they can do it again. Well, I know you've been here for 32 years, so that must be a huge achievement for you. Well done. Thank you. This series, we're following the largest oh. testing programme in the park's history. Many endangered species are at risk from a fatal and highly contagious disease, bovine tuberculosis. Parts of the park are on lockdown and international wildlife breeding programs are at a standstill until they get the all clear. Unfortunately, the keepers don't have to look far to see the devastating effect bovine TB can have. Go on. Steve Crossman and his family have been farming land owned by the Longleat Estate for over three generations. 961. 961. Yeah. Like many farms in Britain, last year Steve's cattle tested positive for TB. Since then, his whole livelihood has been at risk. It's a nightmare. It literally, it literally does mean your business just grinds to a halt. There's nothing you can do about it. Just like the animals in the safari park, in order to get a clean bill of health, the herd must test clear. It's just a waiting game. You're just wishing the time away to get the next test in and hope you go clear. 482. Steve's cows receive exactly the same test as the animals in the safari park. It may be a safer process here on the farm, but it's no less tense. Go on, big boy, off we go. Another positive test this week for Steve would mean more cows being destroyed and trading restrictions remaining in place. We just got to hope it all goes right now. If we go down with TB again on Friday, which is when we're going to have our reading, um, we, we're going to have to seriously sit down and consider the future and see, you know, where we go from here. And we'll, I don't know, set up, I suppose, get out. Just like the keepers, Steve is praying for a good result. Friday is such an important day for us now. If it all goes clear on Friday, we're back in, the, in what I classify as the real world. Yeah. The stress of it is just horrendous. Uncertain times, but hopefully we'll have a clear test and uh, things will go away. Back at the park, it is results day for the lions. 72 hours ago, we, we knocked down the 14 lions. So today, really, it's just a process of reading the test sites. The um, best case scenario for us today is that we find absolutely no reaction whatsoever. The vets must carry out the all-important examination of each lion's skin by sedating them all again. If one lion has this fatal disease, there's a strong chance others will. Head of Safari, John Merrington, is on hand. It's, it's a very tense time. Of course, all the, all the keepers care passionately about the animals. So, so of course, fingers crossed, you want it all, all to come back um, as negative results for the test. Thankfully, the first lion shows no signs of TB. That's, that, that's good news. So, um, just had this one's, this one's got negative results. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, a completely uh, negative result across the board um, would enable us to come out of restrictions. Um, of course, with all these animals we have on the park, they're all part of breeding programs throughout Europe, so um, that will enable us to, to do that. One by one, the 14 lions are sedated. With so many to check, the team must proceed with extreme caution. To enter each pen safely, both keepers and vets must work perfectly in tandem. 
because they're such dangerous animals. They're just testing for responsiveness, and then once they're happy, yep, they're not, not getting any, any flicking ears or, or the he animal's heads aren't moving, they know it's safe to go in. Yeah, let's get in and have a little look. It's looking good. Halfway through, and each lion is testing negative for TB. Yeah, that's, that's clear as well. He's clear. So. Let's hope it continues. So far, so good. OK. Fine. Yeah, another pass. In fact, none of the lions were positive. It's a huge relief. That's fantastic news for today. However, that is only a third of the way through our entire carnival collection. So um, very apprehensive still, very nervous, because we've still got the others to come back. Later in the week, testing continues across the park and farm. But when disaster strikes, what will the consequences be for all involved? Exercise is essential for keeping animals in peak condition, but when it comes to wild animals, it's not always as easy as just popping on a lead. Or is it? Hi, James. Hiya. This is a bit of an unusual sight. Slightly unusual. Who do yes. we have here? So this is Rocky. He's a striped skunk. Uh, that makes me a little bit nervous because I'm at the back end of a skunk here. Should I cover my nose? You're absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, Rocky actually used to be someone's pet. Um, someone's pet? Someone's pet, yeah. They're, they're get, becoming more and more common as people's pets. Um, he's actually been descented, which um, in the UK is actually uh, against the law Yeah, now. that doesn't sound natural. Even though it's possible to have a skunk as a pet, we certainly don't recommend it. Aside from the smell, they can be aggressive and require specialist care. Should we take him for a quick stroll? Yeah, he's definitely raring to go, so uh, let's, let's do, do it. it. Come on, Rocky. And does he like to get up to some quite fast speeds? This or? is close to top speed, so it, it's more of a just a waddle along. He will go wherever he likes, basically, so uh, really he's walking you. So, yeah, I, I actually can feel him just sort of tugging me a little bit there, and I have to say, this is one of the strangest animals I've ever taken for a walk. Uh, tell me more about him in the wild. Who would his predators be? Really, with skunks, not much wants to eat them. So I wonder has, why, James. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, bears are scared of them, wolves are scared of them. Most things will steer clear because of that immense smell. And they can actually shoot up their, the, the smell to up to um, 10 feet, which is, you know, that's pretty impressive. So the spray, is it essentially just wee? Uh, it's not wee. Um, a lot of people also think it's just a fart. Um, it, it's not. It's, it's uh, from a special scent gland. It's, it's basically um, just a fluid, a, a foul-smelling fluid. He's very well behaved, and I have to say he's very relaxing. <laughs> he's doing a, a great job. Yeah, I'm yeah. quite enjoying this walk. So how did Rocky come to you? Uh, so there's a bit of a sad story behind him. Uh, because he was uh, someone's pet, they didn't look after him great at all. They kept mm. him in a very small, confined space. He was uh, brought to us by the RSPCA. When he first arrived, he was for lack of a better term, a monster. He would be hissing and spitting and would try and bite you at any opportunity, but through sheer persistence and positive reinforcement, this is what he got. Well, he seems very happy here. Well, James, I think he's had a good little bit of exercise today. Most definitely. I don't know about you, Rocky, but uh, I'm pretty tired. Definitely. Come on. The park is increasingly involved in the conservation of rare and endangered species. Any animals bred here could one day help save a species from extinction through reintroduction programs. The key to successful breeding, however, begins with two suitable mates. Tim has been looking after two extremely important individuals for the past six years. Oh. So these are Binturong. So we have two males here. We have Tylo and Namtok, uh, brothers. So Tylo here is the one with all the grey flecks in his fur. And then Namtok there is, the, uh, is black and has a little white patch just on his chest. 
The Binturongs live in Jungle Kingdom. This part of the park is thankfully tested free from TB, so they can still be an active part of an international breeding program. The Binturong is under threat of extinction in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Binturong are arboreal, so they kind of live in the treetops. So they are very, very good at climbing. Uh, they've got a few things that help them climb. They have uh, really sharp claws, which helps them uh, climb up trees. They also have this amazing tail, a uh, really long tail. Uh, it's normally about the size of their body, and it's prehensile, so that means that it can grab things. It's a bit like a fifth limb, so they can uh, grab onto branches, they can even hang from it as well if they want to. Their numbers are decreasing at an alarming rate. Over the last 30 years, there has been a 30% drop in the population. To do their bit for conservation, big changes are due to take place tonight. One of our boys will be leaving us. Uh, we'll be going to somewhere in the Netherlands, and then we'll be getting a female from France. Namtok is leaving, and Tylo will remain to be paired with the new female. The brothers have been together all their lives. For such endangered animals, it should be a time of celebration. But Tim knows they have never been separated. You can see how comfortable they are, and they are used to each other's company. Uh, this is what they do a lot of the time when it's sunny, is they sunbathe together. They just lie on each other, make themselves comfortable, and enjoy the sunshine. But, you know, it's for the best. These guys are vulnerable, so it is quite important that you know, they have a captive breeding program. So as hard as it may be to separate them, they will be going on to better things. After a long journey, the female Binturong is getting close. This bittersweet exchange will happen after dark. Security to animal venture, that's your Binturong transporter arrived. That's great news, we'll come out now. Thank you very much. Just a word of caution that obviously, as you're all aware, this is a, is a potentially very dangerous animal. So we want to try and make sure this happens as smoothly as possible. Um, so I'm hoping it's just a case of unloading and straight into the crate, but do obviously watch your fingers, make sure that you keep your exits guarded and have somebody at your back just to make sure that it's all, all nice and smooth. Little is known about the new arrival other than her name, Arabella. Female binturongs are on average 20% bigger than the males. Experts have paired her with Tylo, but no one can guarantee, of course, they'll get on. Oh, look at you, princess. You're beautiful. It's OK, it's, um, sausage. It's okay. With Arabella unloaded, the time has come for Tim to bid farewell to Namtok. They've worked together for six years. Okay. Well done. It's all right. To a nice place. Well, um, travel safely. I'm talk. I'll miss you. Good boy. See you soon. <laughs> the team's attentions must now turn to Tylo and his new mate who's travelled all the way from France. Even though they're not well studied, binturongs are known to make a range of noises a chuckle when they're happy, and a wail when disturbed. This pair won't be in the same pen for some time, but a bad first impression could impact on them being a successful breeding pair. So obviously this is all very exciting. This is the first time they're meeting each other. Some interesting vocals. It's not a great start. The hopes of an international breeding programme rest on these two hitting it off. It's been a big day for the keepers and the binturongs. I think it's time we let them settle down a bit, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I agree. Let's, um, let's get the lights turned off and, uh, and leave them to it. The park is home to some pretty ferocious animals, both large and small. Yes, these are the park's nine pygmy goats, and living amongst them is the notorious Bubble. Probably the least friendly goat in Wiltshire. Possibly the world. 
Or maybe she just doesn't like being filmed. In their native Africa, their hooves get worn down in the arid terrain. But here, they need a bit of help, and it's keeper Tina's job to give them a pedicure. Today, Jean is helping her out. So the first thing we have to do is pretty much catch them. This is M. Piglet, who we're going to do. She's okay. the creamy-looking one. We kind of just have to pick a corner, work as a team, and if she comes near you, don't hold back. Go for the horns, all right? Try not right. to pull her hair. She won't, she won't forgive you. Oh, she's got tiny little horns there. How am I supposed to get hold of them? Uh, practice. Right, you know. OK. So if we head down... OK. So we'll go for that corner over there. So they're heading up. And we're trying to catch <laughs> Piglet. Why do I have the feeling this is going to be harder than it sounds? She's coming over. Right, come on. So if you want to... <laughs> <laughs> this is never going to happen. <laughs> come, come on. Come on. Down, down you up. go. Down you go. That's it. Come. Go, go, go. Oh, who's that? You nearly had her. I nearly had her. Come on, Piglet. Out you come. Don't be shy. It's pedicure time. That's so it. Well, it and this that's is, perfect. This is not hurting her no, at all, no, is this, it? This is the right way to move them about. We always have a couple of people. How often do you girls do this? Um, every four to six weeks, really, to be honest. So why do you have to cut their hoofs so often? If we don't cut them, it causes them to be unbalanced on their feet, which means they are more likely to walk on their heels, which can cause a lot of problems um, later on. What tools do we need? Uh, we need some um, good old uh, hoof snips. They look quite big, Tina. She has got little feet, but mm -hmm. I show you the, these um, are absolutely fine. OK, the first thing we do is you can see she's got mud between her toes. So we want to take all of that dirt out there. And unfortunately, you want to have a good smell of it. Why? And thankfully, it doesn't smell because one of the things you smell for is foot rot. And you will instantly know that if that smells there, that she's got a problem deep in the foot. But I can't smell it, so she, she shouldn't have it. Good. And um, you can see she's got heels here. They're all overgrown. These are the outer walls of the foot. So what we want to do is basically we want to even all this out so mm -hmm. it's a nice flat foot. So you want to make it a nice, long, clean cut. One go, because if you do several cuts, it leaves um, jagged edges. It really is just like a room fingernails. Basically, yeah. You know, it is a bit nerve-wracking at first. You know, you, you're cutting an animal's foot, and they do have a blood supply in here. So you do want to be, you know, careful that you're not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. But once you learn how to handle the tools and things like that, everyone quite enjoys doing it, really. And they quite enjoy it. They get cuddles, and they get nuts afterwards. And, you know, when you've got an overgrown foot, there's nothing better than getting it sorted out, really. That is a perfect foot, and she should be able to walk on that lovely with no problems. Oh, there you go. Right. Piglet one, pedicure done. So, girls, we've only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to go. And for, yeah. Right. And all of them have got four feet. <laughs> Let's get down and get started. Good Come girl, on, you lot. Pedicure time. Come on, pig. Come on. Earlier in the show, our cameras were with the keepers as they welcomed a new arrival. Binturongs live in the forests of Southeast Asia, but these captive animals are part of a delicate breeding program. Arabella has come from France, but her first impressions of Wiltshire lad Tylo weren't great. So keepers have kept them apart for a week. It's really important we take our time with this process. Binturong, they're not very common. Uh, we've never done this before, and we're not going to take any chances. Put them in together straight away, and they didn't like each other. It could end quite badly. Refusing to give up, Tim has been reading what little information there is on Bintiron courtship. And it seems actions could speak louder than words. He's been using our cameras to keep a close eye on their body language. So this footage is a great chance for us to see how they are. So it gives a good indication of what they're going to be like in the future. So it's really important to see that they are getting on, basically. Recently, he's noticed some encouraging behaviour. So even now, they're interacting at the top end of the mesh. You see she's turned upside down. By turning upside down, Arabella's allowing Tylo to smell her. They're very scent-based animals, and it looks like he's sniffing her scent glands, basically. They have a very unique scent. It smells like freshly cooked popcorn, and scent plays a big role in uh, courtship and mating. This extraordinary ritual 
is the first indication for Tim that this pair may have a beautiful friendship ahead of them. Tyler's been chuckling a lot. Uh, he makes a kind of a vocalisation which sounds like someone laughing a bit. It's a good sound, basically. It means he's happy, he's interested, and he's, yeah, he's showing a lot of interest in her. Having said an emotional goodbye to his brother, Tylo may be beginning to accept Arabella as a mate. This is really encouraging stuff based on this footage and how relaxed and how interested and calm they both seem to be. We'll be able to mix them pretty soon. And we'll be back this summer to let you know how this relationship develops. It's almost the end of the show, but there's just time to meet the baby giraffe who is a boy called Evan. I'm here with Polly. And uh, we've just been looking at your latest arrival. And how is he doing? I mean, he looks fantastic. He's doing really well. He's quite a confident little character. He's got that from Mum, Gert, um, here. She's quite a confident character herself, and I think Evan's kind of taken that on as well. And how is he fitting in with the rest of the group? I mean, when... Oh, look, here he is. It's like, I want to steal the limelight. Yeah. Do the rest of the group tend to be quite respectful of a youngster? It depends on the characters in the group. Quite often, the other calves that are maybe a year old or so, sometimes they get a little jealous. Right. Um, or they want to assert themselves over the new ones. But generally, they want to have a sniff, and they're quite respectful. It's just, in the instance, if the new calf looks for milk yes. in the wrong, from the wrong mum, then they get a little upset about that. Evan's actually just having a snack. Oh, oh. someone else is trying to have milk at the same time. Gertie doesn't like that. So that would have been a calf that was born last year, would it? Yeah, you do get milk thieves sometimes. Right. But obviously, Gertie only wants Evan to feed from her, which is why she's walked away. Right. She won't allow the others to steal her milk. And what's his future? Will he stay here or will he go to another herd and have another important breeding programme for Rothschild's giraffe elsewhere? Yeah, um, because he's a boy, he will move on once he... he is mature, yeah. um, so hopefully he would go on to breed somewhere else, but he yeah. might go to a bachelor group for a little while before that. Yeah. So it would be lovely if he could go on breeding somewhere within the UK or in Europe. And what about for later this year? Have you got any more calves due? Potentially. We have a few due in the summer. Oh, really? So maybe when we're back, we might see more. Maybe, yeah. That would be <laughs> really exciting. Well, Polly, thank you very, very much. Always a real treat to see them. Sadly, that's all we've got time for on today's programme. But here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Jean meets Animal Adventure's strangest resident. Wow, he's just completely turned into a little ball. How amazing is that? Animal Park legend Ian risks life and limb for the killer shot of Africa's deadliest animal. They wake up in the morning grumpy and they go to bed grumpy. And we find out what happens when a dangerous animal tries to get out. I've got calves coming in, so he knows that he's got a perfect opportunity. And there goes Dave. Thank <laughs> you. 